I'm going to ask you please to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And as we continue our study of the book of Ephesians, we continue to look at the relationship between parents and their children. And we return this morning to the fourth verse. But let's begin reading in verse 1. Ephesians 6, verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Verse 4 says again, And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we come in this place this morning as a needy people. Joyfully, Lord, peacefully acknowledging that You only are our sufficiency. We ask You now to deal with our hearts, with Your powerful, precious Word, by Your Spirit, His teaching ministry. Lord, only You can change lives. Only You can change minds and hearts. And we look to You for this. We ask You for this, Lord, in the work of salvation. And we ask You for this in the work of sanctification. May You do this, Lord, for Your great name's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we saw the connection between three vital areas. We saw the connection between our view of God, our view of human nature, and our view of raising children. How we raise our children will be determined by what our view of God is, what our view of human nature is, and ultimately, we'll know what our view of those things is when we express our view of salvation. What you believe about salvation tells me what you believe about God and tells me what you believe about human nature. And ultimately, it will tell me what you believe about raising children. Right doctrine produces right living. How we think determines how we feel about things, determines what we actually do. And having seen that connection this morning, I want us to return to this fourth verse to specifically see now what it teaches about raising children. We've seen this, the background sort of for this verse. Now I want us to look at this verse straight on. And our confidence here is in the sufficiency of God's Word. These things are simple, straightforward, but along with the rest of what Scripture teaches on this subject, it's all that we need to raise our children. What do you need to raise your children to the glory of God this morning. You just need this verse and others like it found in the Word of God. That's all you need. And so it's very simple, very straightforward. But I rejoice to say this morning it is sufficient. It's sufficient. And what I want to do today is this. I want to begin with some general observations as we look at this fourth verse. Then I want us to notice some specific things from the verse about how we're to raise our children as Christian people. Let's begin with the general observations. And the first one would be this. All of this instruction is placed in the context of the Christian life. Do you notice how naturally this all flows out to us? He began telling us about how we were saved back in chapter 1. Tells us about what our position is in Christ all the way through to chapter 3. Coming on into chapter 4. And then he tells us of our need to be filled with the Spirit. And he tells us of our need in the Christian family to be submitted to one another. And then he goes from there into the relationship of marriage. And now, having dealt with marriage, he comes into the relationship of children to their parents and now parents to their children. He's just unfolding these things in the context of what it means to be a Christian. One step at a time, more and more information. All of this is placed in the context of the Christian life. And that reminds us that the Christian life is not a compartmentalized life. It's one continuous experience. And parenting is simply a part of living for Christ, if you're a Christian. It's as much a part of your relationship uh, in terms of discipleship toward Christ as anything else you're going to do. It's as much an act of personal devotion on our part toward the Lord Jesus Christ as anything else in our life. 
It's just a part of the Christian life. And that's to say that we cannot be neglecting our parenting responsibilities and say that we're seeking to please Christ in all of our ways. Maybe there's a man here this morning, he says, well, you know, I'm I'm seeking to please Christ at my work and I'm seeking to please Christ in my marriage and I'm working for the Lord at the church. You know, it doesn't matter too much, does it, that I'm really sort of an absentee father? Well, it does matter. If you're seeking to please Christ in all of your ways, this is given to us in the context of the entire Christian experience. This is a part of Christian living. And so you can't neglect your children and say, well, I'm seeking to live the Christian life. No, if you're seeking to please Christ in all of your ways, then if you're a father, if you're a mother, you cannot neglect this instruction. This is a part of Christian living. Now, something else I think about when I think about all of this in the context of the Christian life is, you know, the best thing we could ever do for our children is just live like Christians. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me there's so much sort of specialty information out there on raising kids. All kinds of books, all kinds of studies, all kinds of techniques presented. When really I believe it's as simple as this, the best thing you'll ever do for your children is just live like a Christian. I mean, relate to them as a Christian ought to relate to other people. If your child is not yet a Christian, then if you relate to them as a Christian would relate to them, their greatest need is to know Christ. And you're going to seek to raise them in a way that leads them to the Lord Jesus. And if your child has already come to faith in Christ, then if you were to treat them like a brother or sister in the Lord, you couldn't treat them any better, could you? Now, don't get me wrong. I know there are specific relationships there. Fathers and children, mothers and children. I know about all of that. I'm simply saying the best thing we would do is first understand this is just a part of Christian living. It's a disturbing reality that many times we'll treat our family members in a way that we would never dream of treating a stranger. We'll come to church and people we, we don't know nearly as well, we'll treat them in what we believe to be a Christian manner. We'll relate to them in the right way, speak to them in the right way, sort of have the right attitudes toward them. Then all of a sudden we'll go home and we'll talk to our wife or we'll talk to our children or we'll deal with them in a way we would not even deal with a stranger. And what that points out is, in many cases, a real duplicity in our life. There's a hypocrisy. Maybe we've not even been aware of it, but we've allowed it to creep into our life where we have a public face and then we have a private face. We have a public way of dealing with people and then we have the way we deal with people at home. And so what I want to say this morning is, notice, this comes to us in the context of Christian living. And so live like a Christian first at home. Live like a Christian with your wife or with your husband. Live like a Christian with your children. It's the best thing you'll ever do for them. And so we're reminded of that when we see this is just a part of Christian living. Be filled with the Spirit. Be loving the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be in a position to be the parent that God wants you to be. So my first general observation is this is just a part of Christian living. Raising your children. There's a second general observation that I would point out, all of this is going to require continuous choices. The whole section begins back up in chapter 5, verse 18, when he tells us, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Literally, be being filled. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit of God, He lives in you. And you're to make that continuous, constant choice to be yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ to be submitted to the Word of God. And as you're yielded to Christ and submitted to Scripture, the Holy Spirit of God, He fills your life. He leads you and controls you and empowers you and guides you in living for Christ. And it's on that foundation that then husbands and wives are instructed, children and parents are instructed, slaves and masters are instructed. It all flows out of this idea that we must be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words... As we've said many times, you cannot live this Christian life apart from the divine empowerment. Apart from the Holy Spirit's presence and His power, you can't live this life. Now, when you take that and you remember that, in the context of verse 4, here's what that tells me. Every day that I get up is a day that I must choose to be a good father. And as a day goes on, I must make choices that allow me to be the father to my children that God wants me to be. Just like I have to be being filled with the Spirit, so I must be 
continually making the choices that allow me to honor God in the way that I raise my children. You'll never come to a point where you arrive as a parent. You'll never come to the point where you say, now I've, just, I've got this down. You know, God has a way through our children of reminding us we don't have it all together, doesn't He? You say, I've got this down. I mean, this parenting thing isn't that hard. And there you are telling everybody else how to do it. Well, let me tell you what I've done with my children, right? And then all of a sudden they have a horrible day and God just brings you down to the dust. And you're reminded you don't have this all together. And so if you're going to raise your children in a way that honors God, every day is a new day. Every moment is a new moment. There are choices to be made throughout the course of our lifetime. And then after you're done raising your children and they have children of their own, you have a fresh opportunity as a grandparent to have an influence on children. And again, every day is a new day and a new opportunity. It's going to require continuous choices. There's a third general observation here. You realize all of this follows the teaching on marriage. There, there's a, a logic to this. There's a reason why he dealt with marriage first. Because that's really the foundation for raising your children in the way God wants you to raise them. You know why we're having so, many trouble, so much trouble with our young people today? Because there's so much trouble in marriages. It's one of the reasons. So many broken homes, so much trouble in marriage, so much trouble in the home between the husband and the wife, and then we wonder why our children are confused, upset, lack peace, lack direction. There's a reason why he said, be filled with the Spirit. Then he says, husbands and wives, here's how you relate to one another. Then he says, now, here's how children and parents relate to each other. The foundation for godly parenting is a godly marriage. If you want your children to feel secure and loved, if you want your children to have respect for you as a parent, then let them see you practice Christian love toward the person that you're married to. So many parents operate with this idea that what my children really need to know is that I love them. What will really make them feel secure is to know that I love them. Well, they do need to know that you love them. But you know what they want to know as much as that? They want to know that you love the person you're married to. That's what makes them feel secure. When they know you love their mother or you love their father. That you two are going to honor God together in your relationship. That you really love each other. Now there is an atmosphere to make children feel secure. You say, well, Pastor, what do I do if sin has already brought a problem in this area of my life? No doubt there's somebody sitting here this morning, you're married to a non-Christian. People here today who've been divorced, there are single parents in this place, no doubt. What do you do? Well, what you do is you're honest, first of all, with yourself and with the Word of God about what has happened. One of the things that, that I see about guilt in Scripture and one of the things that I've learned in my own life is guilt never goes away by justifying yourself. You say, well, I didn't do wrong. I didn't do wrong. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do wrong. And you know what? That will never make guilt go away. Because our conscience is there. And the Holy Spirit is there. And the Word of God is there. Now, the way that guilt is removed is when you acknowledge your sin before God and you thank God for the price paid for that sin by His Son. And you accept your forgiveness on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's where there's freedom from guilt. And so first, I must deal with my sin in, in an honest way and say, here's where I failed. Here's where I sinned. Here's where sin devastated us and ravaged us. But thank God He's forgiven me for that. And, kids, here is God's standard. And this is where we're going to stand from here on out as a family. All of us are in need of the grace and mercy of God. And thank God He gives grace and mercy. But now also there must be obedience on the part of His people. And here is God's standard. And I want to raise you in a way that spares you from the heartache and the pain that I've known in my life. I want to raise you in a way that your marriage doesn't experience what my marriage did. And you know what's amazing? When you, when you deal with sin that way and you deal with your children that way, there is something there for them to respect and to respond to positively. 
And so in terms of general observations, first note, this is just a part of Christian living. Raising your children is just a part of your relationship to Christ. Your devotion to Christ will be reflected in the way you deal with your children. And all this is going to require continuous choices. Every day is a new day. Every moment's a new moment. There must be choices made along the way all the time that honor the Lord. And all of this is built on the foundation of the teaching on marriage. If you want to raise your children in a way that honors God, then look to your marriage and honor Christ there. There's something else in the way of a general observation. Notice how simple all of this is. All of this is kept simple, isn't it? Verse 4, And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's it. That's all he says. And if you go over to the book of Colossians, a parallel passage in chapter 3, in verse 21, he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. And that's all he says. I mean, very brief, very simple. And I challenge anyone, I defy anyone to find any place in Scripture where raising children is presented to us in a very complicated way. It just isn't. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that any approach to systematizing the raising of children violates the spirit of Scripture. Are there things that we can learn from the experience of others and benefit from? Yes. But is there a system that we're to duplicate that we gather from others in terms of how to raise our children? What do you think the answer is? No, there's no system. If a system was necessary, Scripture would have given it to us. Now, what we must do is, first of all, be saved. We must know Christ. Then be yielded to Christ, filled with the Spirit, and just live out the Christian life and pay attention to these warnings and these brief bits of instruction. And you know what? There's everything you need for your family to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. No system is necessary. That tells me that a cold, mechanical approach to raising children is wrong. Uh, in my young Christian life, I attended a few seminars. On um, One was on basic youth conflicts. And one of the things, I didn't notice it as much when I was younger, but the older I got in the Lord, the thing that I noticed was how many rules there were. How many things you had to remember. How many things you had to do a certain way. And you know what? None of it is found in the Word of God. This cold, mechanical, calculated way of raising children, you just don't find it in Scripture. And what else that tells us is we ought not to feel pressured that we have to do it just like someone else is doing it. You know what's sad sometimes? Sometimes the most oppressive place in the world can be the church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't do it with your kids, just like I'm doing it with my kids, you are in sin, right? And you've got to say it like that. I mean, you just got to really say it like that. And if you're not doing it just like we're doing it, listen, there is no system to duplicate. And if you look for a manual on raising children, you're going to always feel inadequate. There isn't one. You, sh you know what? All the commands of God can be summed up in this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you live out those two commands, you'll find yourself living out every other command in the Word of God. No system here. It's very simple. All of this is kept simple. So those are some general observations. Let's move to some specific ones. What do we see here in the way of specific instruction? Well, one, Christian parents, it's very clear in verse 4, Christian parents have a God-given responsibility concerning their children. As soon as you had a child, you became responsible before the Lord. There's an accountability and a responsibility there. And again, this just flows out of the general Christian experience. All throughout the Word of God, you see that the stronger have a responsibility toward the weaker. And in this case, you have parents having responsibility toward their children. And you've got to realize what a unique thing this was in the world in which Paul wrote this letter. This was entirely unique to the Greco-Roman world. A Roman father had life and death power over his children. In Roman society, the family was disintegrating. Family affection was almost inconceivable. And now all of a sudden in this passage, 
fathers, parents are being taught to actually care about the feelings of their children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. What does that say? Listen, you're to actually give thought and consideration and care to how you're making your children feel. Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Don't act in a way that causes them to lose heart. What does that say? Look, as a, as a father, as a parent, I ought to care about how my children feel because of the way I'm raising them. This was something entirely unique to Christianity. That a father would care about the feelings of his children. And so we're reminded here that as Christian parents, we ought to care about that. And we're also taught here that we're to raise them for the Lord. This is our responsibility to raise them for the Lord. We don't raise them according to the child's desires. When I say care about the feelings of your children, I don't mean that you raise them according to their feelings. If you do that, you're going to make some major mistakes. I feel like I'd like to stay up till 2 o'clock this morning. Dad, what do you think? I feel like I'd like to eat pizza all the time. What do you think? Now, you don't raise them according to their feelings or their desires. That's not what I mean. But neither do you raise them according to your feelings and your desires. He says in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, we're to raise them according to the Lord's desires. What does God want for their life? What does He want for my life? Now look, that's to, what I, that's to be what I keep in front of me as I raise my children. I realize that they are a gift from God, a heritage from the Lord. They don't belong to me. They belong to Him. And now I have a God-given privilege and responsibility to influence them, teach them, instruct them, discipline them, raise them in a way that will honor and please Him. I'm raising them for Him. That ought to be the mindset of every parent. I'm raising my child for Him. Let me just pause here and ask you this morning, is that how you're raising your children? I mean, is that a conscious thing before you? Do you think in that way? Remember, as I said earlier, these are continuous choices. Do you get up in the morning and remind yourself today, parent, that this day I'm to raise my child for Him. I'm to teach and influence and instruct and discipline for Him. Not according to my desires, not according to the child's desires, but according to the Lord's desires. So the first specific observation here is, this is a responsibility. He's speaking to fathers here. God is, is addressing fathers, and He says, don't provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Wherever God gives a command, wherever God gives instruction, now you have responsibility and accountability, so you have Christian parents having a God-given responsibility to raise their children in a way that considers their feelings, yet is not dictated by their feelings or the parents' feelings, but rather by the Lord's desires. There's a second specific thing here. Notice that Christian fathers are to take a leadership role. Now, the passage makes plain that both parents are in view. Because verse 2 says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Both parents are in view. But it does seem, both here and in the book of Colossians, that there's a special emphasis placed on the role of fathers. Now, this is very interesting because it, it seems in our culture, for a lot of years now, we're becoming more and more of a generation raised by mothers. Very maternalistic society. And yet, here in Scripture you see that there is a leadership role that's to be taken by fathers. Now, this does not negate the responsibility, of course, to honor your, your mother. You should do that. And this does not nullify the insight and the wisdom of the mother. But what this does do is place a responsibility on Christian fathers to give leadership in their home. Uh, to say it very simply, you cannot have a home. If you're Christians, if you have a husband and wife who are Christians, your home is not honoring the Lord if the dad is an absentee father. You've got to be involved, man, with your children. Is it your attitude that basically you go off, you go to work, you earn the living, you bring home the paycheck, and it's her job to raise the children? 
Is it your attitude that it's mom's responsibility to look to their education, make sure they do their homework, make sure they're learning certain character qualities that are essential for their life, to honor the Lord in the future? Is it your mindset that that really is her responsibility and not anything you're responsible for? Because if that's your mindset, you're wrong. Mom has a a very influential role. This is why women are instructed in the book of Titus to be keepers at home. No doubt about it. She has an influential role, but dad is to be at the head, leading the way in all of these things. Directing, giving direction, showing the way. You say, well, where where should men be leading? Where should fathers be leading? Notice the third bit of specific instruction. We're told exactly what we're not to do and what we should do. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Very simple instructions, but tremendous and specific. He says, first of all, what we're to avoid. Fathers, parents in general, but fathers taking the lead, we are not to provoke our children to anger. We're to avoid parenting them in a way that would cause our children to become resentful toward our training. As your children grow up, here's a real question. Do they, do they keep an open heart towards you? Or do you see that your parenting is producing a resentful spirit that closes them off from you? It's a real test of what kind of job you're doing. We're to parent them in a way that doesn't provoke them, cause them to become resentful. Now, it's instructive, I think, that there's no list here of, of what does that. You say, well, what does that? There's no list. Well, let me just give you a few examples. Again, I I go back. I want to say it again. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and if you love them as your neighbor, as yourself, you'll avoid the kind of thing that causes them to become resentful. But let's give some specific examples. It helps. Here's some things that seem to cause children to become resentful. First of all, we can mention neglect. When you act like the child's not even there. When you have no real involvement with them. And as a father of four children, I can tell you, the more children you have, the more of a challenge that becomes with each individual child. It's so easy in the midst of a bunch of children to let one, especially the quiet one, especially the obedient one, especially the most compliant one, it's easy to let them begin to live in your home as if they're not even there. But if you're not careful with that and don't look to that, there can be a resentment built up in the heart that basically says, I guess I don't matter. Neglect. No involvement with them. Another thing that will do this is overprotection. On the opposite end of the extreme is you don't let them breathe. You forget they're, even though they're, they're little people, they're still individuals. God placed them into your care, yes, but they are still an individual. And ultimately, what we're training our children to do is to live on their own. To leave our home and to live for the Lord on their own. To see another generation raised up that honors Christ. And so, we need to remember that. And as we're training them, we we don't need to just simply make them extensions of our personality. And so, overprotect them that there's no individuality. Got to be careful of overprotection. It can cause resentment. And then one of the chief things, I think, is hypocrisy. What builds resentment in children? It's when they hear you say one thing and live something entirely different. When they see that you say they can't do something, but then you do something. Along these lines, also, it's when you're never willing to own up to your wrong. And you never ask for their forgiveness when you've wronged them. I wonder, are there parents in this place that you have one standard for your children and another standard for you? You say, don't do what I do, just do what I say? Are there parents in this place that you're never wrong? You never sin? You never need to ask their forgiveness. It will cause resentment when there's hypocrisy. 
Now, I've got news for all the parents in this place. You can tell your children you never do wrong. They know better. They know better. And you know, it's an encouraging and godly atmosphere in a home when everyone in the home knows they need forgiveness. When everyone in the home can own up to sin. When everyone in the home can say, I've asked God to forgive me and now I ask you to forgive me. Something else that will cause resentment is immaturity. This is something I've seen, especially in my lifetime, I think more than our fathers and forefathers saw, but you see people who just don't want to grow up. They don't want to be a parent. Not really. They want to have children, but they don't want to be a parent. They don't have any, any time to go watch their children play because they're still too busy playing. And remember this this morning, beloved. Listen, a child, our, chi- our children don't need peers. They have peers. They need parents. And you're not going to win their heart and you're not going to influence their life by trying to make them think you're with it. In fact, nothing turns a young person off more than when their parents try to act like they're with it. They know you're not with it. And you ought to know you're not with it. And they don't need a peer. They need a parent. And so when there's immaturity in a man or a woman, not willing to grow up, always running off with their friends, always staying busy, never having time for their children, causes resentment. Severity can cause resentment. When you deal with your children's failings in a harsh manner, when they can't do anything right, when you're entirely negative in your training, when the punishment doesn't fit the crime, harsh discipline causes resentment. Favoritism. When you compare one child with another unfavorably, hold them up to some other standard, don't recognize the unique things and the special things that God has put into their life, causes resentment. One other thing I'll mention and be done with it, passivity does. You know, believe it or not, even with our depravity, there's still something in the nature of man that knows that boundaries speak of love. There's something within the human nature that knows if my parents love me, they're going to tell me no sometimes. And they're going to put boundaries around my life. And there are going to be rules. And so one of the things that will build resentment in a child's heart and life is when you basically just let them run free. No rules, no boundaries, no real activity on your part. But again, this is just a list that I've come up with. The Bible doesn't give us a list. Live the Christian life. Live like a Christian towards your children. You'll avoid what he says to avoid here. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That's what you need to remember this morning. Do not provoke your children to anger. Tells you what to avoid. But he also tells you what we're to provide. Doesn't tell us just what to avoid, tells us what to provide. Look at verse four. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that that word translated bring them up is the same word translated nourishment in chapter 5, verse 29. Look back there. Chapter 5, verse 29. Verse 28 says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes. Nourishes. Same Greek word. It's translated here, bring them up. And so we're to nourish our children. That is, as a parent, here's one of the things I'm to provide. I'm to provide for their physical needs. Make sure that their needs are taken care of. That's a parental responsibility. And if that's a parental responsibility given by God, should I make my children feel like it's an awful thing to do? Oh, you're such a burden. Oh, look at what we have to do. Look at how much money it costs us. Look at how we have to take care of you. Do you think that is is a godly way to view what is a God-given responsibility? God says, bring them up. 
It means I'm to nourish them. It's a joy. It's a joy. But he also says, not only bring them up, he says, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. Now, this is a more, more of a general word. It speaks of the complete training of our children. I go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It speaks of Jesus growing up as a child. It says, He kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If you take that statement and look at it, it speaks of <clears throat> physical maturity, spiritual maturity, mental and social maturity. Kept increasing in wisdom, mental, stature, physical, favor with God, spiritual, and men, social. And this is where we're to provide training for our children. We're to, we're to give our attention to their entire upbringing. Take care of them physically, spiritually, mentally, educationally, socially. Proverbs 13.24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And that doesn't just speak of correction. It speaks of all the training that goes on in his life. Parents, you cannot be an effective parent. I speak to myself on this as well as to you. Listen, we cannot be effective parents if we're not willing to give effort, attention, time, diligence. That's what it speaks of. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Takes effort. Takes effort. Something else he says we're to do here. He says we're to give them instruction. Verse 4. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This word has more to do with verbal instruction. You need to talk to them. Teach them. Train them. Instruct them. It breaks your heart, but I've heard adults say that they grew up in a home that if they, if they thought about their entire time at home, you're talking about years and years at home, they couldn't think of a single real conversation they ever had with their father. Can you imagine such a thing? But now let me ask you, dads, moms, when's the last time you sat down and just had a real conversation with your child? I mean, just talk to them. Listen to them. Find out what's going on in their life. Find out what's bothering them. Or what's a joy in their life. Or what they're looking forward to. Or what their hopes are. Or what they believe the Lord wants to do in their life in the future. When's the last time you sat down and just had a conversation with them? You realize in verse 4, he's telling us that not only do we have a responsibility to provide for physical needs, and not only do we have a responsibility to look at the whole of their life and give training in the whole of their life, but he says specifically, we have a responsibility to teach them, to instruct them. And then what makes all of this Christian training is what is found at the end of verse 4. He says that all of this bringing up and all of this dis dis uh, discipline and all of this instruction is to be done in the Lord. It is of the Lord that we're giving this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so as Christian parents, we're not parenting like a lost and dying world. All of it, all of this activity flavored with the salt of God's grace and the salt of God's truth and the salt of God's presence and the salt of God's Son. Is that your home? If we could be a fly on the wall in our homes, what is the atmosphere really like? Is there discussion of the Lord? Is there discussion of His truth? Is there instruction? Is there joy? Is there peace? Is there an acknowledgement of the presence of God in these places we call our homes? They ought to be worshipful places. Places where the presence of God is felt. Now let me close this morning by giving you five practical lessons about this discipline and training from Scripture. How this discipline and this training ought to be done. Number one, let all that we do be done in love. What's the common denominator that ought to hold it all together? What's the common atmosphere that ought to influence and permeate it all? It ought to all be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Let all that you do be done in love. 
Let your children know as you're raising them that it's a joyful thing. That it's a God-given privilege. That while you look forward to whatever stage the Lord has for them in their life in the future, you know what? I told, I told one of my kids this yesterday. If I could, I'd just keep them where they are for a few more years. I love this time in my life. Jackie loves I know we love this time in our life. We enjoy this. Nothing more enjoyable to us than having our children with us. And you know, the thing is, if you'll give your attention to raising your children, they can be a joy to be around. When we were young, young parents, I can remember, you know, it seemed like everything you got invited to, people wanted you to leave your children at home. You know what our response to that was? We just didn't go. Because we, wouldn't, we, we couldn't think of, if we did go somewhere by ourselves, we were constantly thinking, I wonder how the kids are doing you know, we want to get home. We want to see. We enjoy this time. That's a loving it. Let your children know they're a joy in your life. Let all that you do be done in love. Second, let our teaching be real and lifestyle. Deuteronomy six four. Listen to this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words, which I'm commanding you today, shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What does that say? It says all the time. When you get up in the morning, when you lie down at night, when you walk through the day, and he does, it, he does not mean by that that they were constantly quoting Scripture to one another all throughout the day. What he's telling us is, look, this is as natural to us as breathing. We have a real relationship with the living God. We really do love Him. This is not pretend stuff. This is not just words. He is our life. And if something is, if someone is your life, don't you talk about Him? Don't you think about Him? Don't you discuss Him? Don't you learn about Him? Don't you want to follow Him? So all throughout your day, what are you doing as a family? You're enjoying one another because you enjoy the God who saved your soul. It's natural. It's lifestyle. It's all the time. It's right to have a family altar, to have a family devotion. We've encouraged you to do that this summer. We've given you those catechisms. Encourage you morning and evening to spend time with your family. But you know what? If I had a choice between one of our church families having a morning devotion and an evening devotion every day and then acting like Christ isn't real throughout the rest of the day or having no family devotion in morning and evening but talking about the Lord all throughout the day every day, which one do you think we ought to choose? We don't have the choice, do we? We can do both. But you understand what I'm saying? This is real stuff and as a result, it ought to be lifestyle. Natural. Which gets to a third thing. When we think about leading our children to Christ, and we think about teaching them about the Lord, very important, let us not desire anything but the Lord's real work. In other words, don't pressure your child. Don't play on the emotions of your child. Don't try to manipulate them into the kingdom or into loving the Lord. It won't work. Don't make it a matter of personal loyalty to you. Well, if you really love Dad, or if you really loved your mother. Now look, you don't want anything less than a real work of God in their soul. Which means that you pray for them and you live the Christian life before them and you teach them and you instruct them, but you realize all along the way, who has to save them? Who saved you? Who poured out a love in your heart for the Lord? Why do you desire these things? Why do you want to teach your children? Was it because you were strong-armed, arm-twisted into the kingdom? Was it because you were, you were manipulated? Was it because your emotions were played on? Or was it because a sovereign, saving God made you alive when you were dead? Which was it? Now, if you came to love the Lord because of a real work of God in your soul, what do you want for your child? 
Nothing less, right? Nothing less. It's amazing. We know these things, but somehow sometimes we don't know these things. Parents will... Literally one time I had somebody, they, they didn't come back here anymore because they came and brought their daughter in wanting her to be baptized. Said that she knew the Lord. Sat down in the office, asked her, a little bitty girl, maybe five years old, I don't remember her exact age, talked to her about the Gospel, explained the Gospel. She could not tell me in her own words anything that reflected a right understanding of the Gospel. And so I said to the mother, you know, here's the, here's the good news. If she knows the Lord and we wait to baptize her, it won't mean she doesn't know the Lord. And baptism is not necessary for her to go to heaven. What we don't want to do, though, is baptize her and give her something to hang a false assurance on if a real work of God has not occurred in her soul. Mother was upset. What's wrong in that mother's thinking? What's wrong is this commitment. I don't want anything less than a real work of God in my child's soul. Nothing less. And if they walk an aisle, if they enter the baptistry, if, they're on, if their name is on the roll of a church, if they end up being a deacon one day, if they're in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, but they don't know Christ, that is a tragedy. What I want is my children to really know the Lord. Really know Him. Let's not desire anything less but the Lord's real work. There's a fourth thing. Tying all this in together, just be ready, parents, to give your child a reason for the hope that's in you. You know, if you love the Lord and you're teaching them and you're living the Christian life before them, there are going to be times when they want to talk to you. When they want to ask you. Listen to Deuteronomy 6.20. Same passage where they were told, as you rise up, as you walk through the day, as you lay down at night, listen to this. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What do the testimonies and statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. And He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which He had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. And it will be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God just as He commands us. But I love the way that passage starts out. Verse 20, When your son asks you in time to come saying, What do these things mean? And you see parents want to be living the Christian life in such a way, there's such an attractiveness to it that our children would say to us, Dad, what does this mean? Why, Dad? Why do you see such importance in Bible reading? Why do you spend time in prayer? Dad, what's the purpose for this? That then there's the opportunity to give them the reason for the hope that's in your life. Which leads to the fifth and final thought. It's found in both of those passages, actually, that I've read from Deuteronomy. Let our teaching be from our own devotion to Christ. You can't teach what you don't know. You can't impart what you don't have. And to say you're going to teach your children to love the Lord when you don't love Him is deception. You know... I thank God for Awana ministry and there are many, many good things in the Awana ministry. But one of the things that's always broken my heart about Awana is to see parents pull up, drop their kids off, leave them, that's fine, that's how the ministry works, come back before evening service, pick them up and leave. I think to myself, you're telling your children Bible memorization and all this is important enough for me to drop you off on Sunday afternoon. But then the Word of God is not important enough for me to come back Sunday night. What are you teaching them? You will not be able to teach your children to love the Lord if you don't love Him. To love His Word if you don't love His Word. To hunger for the truth if you don't hunger for the truth. Tell others about Christ if you don't ever tell others about Christ. 
Let our teaching be from our own devotion to Christ. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them. You see, it's to be on your heart. And then you teach them. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed, you know the foundation, the doorway into everything that we've talked about this morning is a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Until someone is born again, until they're born from above, until their sins have been forgiven and they've been reconciled to God through Christ, none of this will make any sense to them and they'll have no capacity to live it. Do you know Christ? Have you been saved? And if not, do you realize God has made the way for you to be saved? His Son, Jesus Christ, stepped out of heaven 2,000 years ago. Almighty God in human flesh. Lived a perfect life on this earth. Qualified to die in the place of sinners. Died on a cross to pay for all the sins of all those who will trust Him. He was raised from the dead. His sin sacrifice accepted by the Father. And now eternal life is offered to sinners. Free. But it's found in Christ. Look to Christ. Ask Him to save you. Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've had together in your word this morning. Blessed to our hearts and lives, we pray. In Jesus' name.